I have a question. How many people own a Bible? Raise your hand. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> How many people have a Bible in their home? Oh, my goodness. What a religious group I'm in front of here today. <laughs> now, if you were to take out your Bible and begin to read the stories of the Gospels, let's start with Mark, since it's the least embellished, and then read through the Gospels. And let's imagine that you had never heard of Christianity, you had never heard the word Christ, you had never entered a Christian church, you were unfamiliar with it all, but you were just reading it for the first time. And you had no biases as you began to read. And then your assignment, let's just imagine, would be, I'm trying to find out what the major themes of these stories are. And I think if you did that, you would find that there are indeed some major themes that come up again and again in the words, story, and the narrative that you read. And one of the themes would be that the outcasts and the marginalized were embraced. People who had been shunned, who had been cast aside, who had been ignored, who had been vilified, were embraced. Another theme that you would see is that there was a continual critique of domination. The new world that was being brought into being was one in which the first would be last and the last first and that this theme was reflected again and again. And bear in mind, I'm using modern terminology that was not used in the Bible itself, but I'm using modern terminology to describe the themes that I see as I read the story of Jesus with unbiased eyes. I would also see the theme of the envisioning of a world without enemies. I would also see a theme of dissolving of the walls between people and groups. There was not a us versus them, but we are part of one thing. I would see a theme again and again of radical forgiveness, of the practice of empathy, compassion, I would see the prominence of the role of women that was counter to the culture. I would see, surprisingly, healing, both physical and emotional, ideas that might be particularly difficult for our modern mind, but it is as though the community they were creating actually affected people's physical and mental and emotional health. I would see that Jesus taught in stories that are particularly an open form of communication where one is involved and engaged in something. This occurred in a time, these themes occurred in a time in which society was completely devoid of the notion of individual rights, of democratic process, of education as we know about it, where brutality and oppression was the norm, where poverty was so far below what we are familiar with and so far below our current living standards as to be unimaginable, where life was short, brutish, and filled with terrible and fearful events. And within this framework, Jesus spoke about these changes that I had just enumerated as the appearance of the kingdom of God, a notion grounded in Jewish mysticism and tradition, and the authority of the Roman government based on domination and oppression asserted itself against Jesus' message and crucified him 
a killing common, a way of killing common for the times. But the people who had experienced this alternative community and reality that gathered around this figure, Jesus, could not let Jesus' crucifixion be the final word. When they met after his death, their meeting with one another evoked his presence and his memory. And so they were open to the ideas that he had risen again and that he was still alive. And in fact, they made it part of their faith that he was alive in their community in the world. The resurrection story can mean many different things to many different people and does. I believe the resurrection story represents the human impulse to not let the experience of compassion, empathy, justice, and peace among people and within people die. The body of Jesus might have died but what he embodied and evoked lives and must continue to live. It is the impulse to let these qualities live that is behind the story of the resurrection to my mind. They are conveyed in language that we are unfamiliar with and probably uncomfortable with, but the underlying message is one we can all understand. And one could say... That the story of Jesus, like the stories of Buddha, Socrates, and St. Francis, and many others, represents an important transition in our life as a species. Our bodies, our minds, our behaviors were forged in the long, long journey of evolution. The wars, destructiveness, and chaos exhibited daily by our species reflects the patterns embedded in our deep evolutionary past. There is a contrast between our potential to live constructively and morally and acting out, on the other hand, our most primitive tendencies. Martin Luther King Jr. said it well when he said, we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters or we will perish together as fools. The Easter faith at its core is not merely about something that happened or might have happened long ago. It is a story of an ongoing struggle that is happening right now. And that struggle is how can we live a life individually and collectively based on empathy, compassion, respect for human dignity, a reverence for life and justice, and not be subsumed and overtaken by the forces of our human nature which push toward regression, oppression, injustice, and violence. That struggle was reflected in the work of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. A half century later in 2013 in North Carolina, it happened again in the work of Reverend William Barber II when he launched the Moral Monday Crusade. He sought to unite people of all races and creeds by framing the fight for progress within a framework set in moral terms. There is a line flowing between the story of Jesus 2,000 years ago that was embodied by many people, and one of them most recently was Reverend Martin Luther King, and that flowed right through Reverend Barber and many others and flows right into us and what we do here at this congregation. We are part of the same moral and spiritual movement that moves through history. It does not matter what the content of our beliefs are, but what the quality of our moral aims are. 
The late Harvard biologist Edward O. Wilson said that we are today a complicated mixture of Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike powers of technology and science. There has never been a more important time to carry the light of hope for a society based on empathy, compassion, and respect for human dignity, a reverence for life and justice. My point is that we are engaged here on a good and important work that is part of a continuous stream of living and being that has been going on for thousands of years and that it is important for us to carry that work forward. It is important for the viability of our species and those who follow. May we renew our commitment to this great work evoked by the Easter story.